Before we get started, I want to tell you all about one of my favorite sponsors of the show, Heshi Socks, H-E-S-H-I Socks.com. If you go to Heshi Socks.com and use promo code WELCOME30, you get 30% off your entire order. Why do I love Heshi Socks? Why do I actually wear Heshi Socks? Because they're the most comfortable kick-ass fashion socks for work or play. They got a bunch of styles. They got the ankle socks. You got the basic socks. You got the fashion socks. You wear them to work, wear them to the gym. They don't wear out. Your feet are comfortable. Your feet don't smell. It's high-end Pima cotton, which is extremely breathable in the warm weather. And they're also treated with antimicrobial properties to keep your feet fresh and smelling right. If you go to H-E-S-H-I socks.com and use promo code WELCOME30, you get 30% off. Let's start the show. Good afternoon, Michael Malice here, and let that be your welcome for the next hour. In anticipation of my book on the new right coming out in two weeks, we have live in studio probably the most notorious radioactive guest I've had to date, Faith Goldie. I wear that as a badge of honor. More radioactive than that kid from Chernobyl with those flipper arms. I knew that guy. Yeah, he's a cute kid. (laughs) Take your iodine. Yeah, he meeting me was his make a wish. (laughs) So we've got a lot to cover. You're an activist. You ran for Toronto mayor. That's correct. Canadian. Mm -hmm. Thank you for crossing the border, uh, (laughs) getting all the way in here. Um, So how how would you describe your politics? Because you've been attacked, and we'll get into that in a second, from the left, from the right. How would you describe yourself? Well, I'm unabashedly a nationalist. I believe in the nation state. I believe in people who are part of that nation. I believe in borders. I obviously want us to have healthy relations in a geopolitical sense, but I don't necessarily want us to let the entire third world into, especially my socialized country. I'm also a social conservative, so that means that I'm pro-life. I do believe even civic moral consensuses. I think they're good. I'm not a moral relativist. And I'm also unabashedly a Christian. So that basically wraps, you know, me up. I I love God. I love my country. I love my family, which basically makes me sound like your average Fox News girl. Um, But I I also um, am a little bit, uh, let's say, more open-minded and more uh, rigorous of a thinker on certain issues when it comes to the nation. What about Second World? Are you in favor of second world immigration? Well, second world, I would probably, I, I mean, I don't know how you define that, but I would say it's like- It's a form of communist bloc. Yeah, exactly. So um, I would say that I'm okay with it because I think that their um, cultures are largely much more compatible with our cultures in the West. In Canada, for instance, we have the largest uh, diaspora of Ukrainians in the world. We have at 1.2 million out of 35, 36 million. That's a lot of people. So, so you and I were just talking earlier. We both have Ukrainian roots. I was born in Ukraine. Yeah, we're both Western Ukrainian too. My yeah. grandfather was, uh, I mean, he was born about 16 kilometers. I don't know how many miles that is from where I you were I think it's born. about 75. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so, so yeah, um, I mean, Ukrainians, for instance, are part of the foundational stock of my country. But that being said, I am not a uh, you know, these people are not those people alone. Right now, I think my country is in need of a moratorium. So I'm at a no one for now. We need some me time in Canada. Okay, let's go through some names you've been called. And let's say uh, labels you've been called. I disavow of them all unless it's beautiful. Uh, I, I've never heard you called beautiful. Oh, come so on. <laughs> I should introduce you to my husband. Um, <laughs> let's and say, say whether you agree with these terms or not. Okay. Okay, Nazi. No. National Socialist. No. Racist. No. Identitarian. I think that's a loosely term, loosely loosely defined term. I'd say possibly. Alt right. No. What distinction do you have between your views and those of the alt right? Well, the alt right is an umbrella term, and there are a lot of different, uh, I'd say, caveats under that umbrella um, that even distinguish people within the alt right. <laughs> so, uh, issues uh, around you know certain ethnic groups, around women, around even the environment, and the alt right in and of itself. I was never a subscriber to this particular term, and I would say that after Charlottesville, people who clung on to this term, I think, were just bad for business when it came to any sort of sophisticated thinker on the so-called dissident right. So for me, I'm not a simple, plain old, you know, racist. Does that mean that I don't believe in things like science, uh, evolutionary science, etc.? Um, 
No, not necessarily. And, and look, at the end of the day, I think that these these particular terms are basically um, forms of, of just oppression to try to get us to shut up. They call you these names in order for you to get scared into not talking about these issues. What's all right? All right. Why don't you ask the guy who basically coined the term? That's Richard Spencer. It's his term, you know, and what Richard Spencer is about is frankly, a lot more left leaning politics, a lot more left leaning um, ideas around empire and internationalism than what I'm about. Let's get into what Richard Spencer, perfect, perfect segue. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's get into what Richard Spencer said about you. So you ran about you ran for mayor of Toronto, right? Failed Badly. Oh, ter terribly. <laughs> I, I was uh, top three out of 35 candidates. Yeah, but you had like 4% of the vote. Yeah. That's, but like, I was, that's like Gary Johnson. But I was... You're the Gary Johnson of candidates, Faith Goldie. Don't do that to me. Well, that's the fact. <laughs> I was banned from all debates. I wasn't allowed to participate in the democracy-like uh, democracy process. So I think we did well considering we were, you know... So here's well what Richard Spencer had to say about you after you lost that uh, mayoral race. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I want to hear, and then I have your response and I want to hear what you have to say. Now, for people who don't know, Richard Spence is probably one of the biggest figures of the alt-right. He's very famous. I don't even remember what you're about to read right now. Okay. Just so you know. That's, uh, okay. Right. Um, I'm sure you saw this. this is from October of, of 2018. Ah, uh, yes. October of 2018. I remember that day. Yeah. Well, uh, well, it was, it was probably right after the election. Yeah, no? yeah, yeah. He goes, Toronto's Faith Golty's run for Toronto mayor was ultimately demoralizing. Okay, he goes, I once thought she could be a bridge figure. I'm now convinced she's bridge to nowhere. I guess he meant a bridge to nowhere. Um, and he goes, she's demoralizing because she ran against, uh, had the very worst aspects of quixotic and pragmatic. She ran a campaign that was only about her brand and proved she has precious few ideas or ideals behind that. And then he go she goes, um, uh, her campaign will be remembered for her shrill yelling, yelling at opponents, lo uh, loomering. <laughs> and what you wrote back, you said later in, this is in January, to him, you said, Richard Spencer is a satanic racial imperialist, <laughs> not a nationalist. So what do you mean by satanic racial imperialist? I, I was quoting a Vox, uh, Vox Day article over there. And, you know, Richard Spencer, as I understand it, does believe in some sort of almost imperialistic European Union-esque sort of way forward for people who are indigenous to Europe. So he's not just about a so-called ethno state, which is what a lot of the left will say, oh, these people, they're so crazy. They want an ethno state. Uh, Poland is an ethno state. Hungary is an ethno state. You know, most of Europe, most of Africa, most of the the, the Asian world, those are all ethno states, okay? And as I understand, um, you know, Richard's, you know, worldview is that he thinks we need to move even beyond the nation and that, you know, race, so to speak, is what should unite people. And so um, I'm not in that bag. Uh, I believe in the nation state. I don't think that the European Union is good for Europeans, for instance. Um, but but just to circle back to his comments for a moment. But, I, I, I'm sorry, I, mm -hmm. that, that's a very key point because mm -hmm. uh, again, these the, this type of mentality like Richard Spence, not him mm -hmm. specifically, if they were for that, they would be for the European Union because mm -hmm. it's a nation state of whites, mm -hmm. but they're very much against the European Union as you are. It's a, it's a super state. And look, at the end of the day, with respect to Richard, he's sort of um, made himself irrelevant uh, insofar as he has shown a, a tremendous amount of poor judgment from Hailgate going forward. And with response to his comments about me and my campaign, uh, number one, I don't care. Number two, <laughs> he's wrong. Uh, and, and I'll tell you why. Uh, what he presented there was a completely cartoonish uh, evaluation of my campaign. We had a robust platform that was very nuanced, that spoke to the really popular and uh, populist sentiments of Torontonians. We now have a murder rate that's above that of New York City's where we Wait, are seriously? now. Absolutely. We now have a homeless and 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 housing shortage right now that's way out of control and uh, over half of our shelter beds are occupied by illegal migrants into Canada. Okay, the Toronto taxpayer didn't ask for any of these. But things. how did they I, I'm not I'm sorry, but how did they actually get to Canada? It's not actually easy to get to Canada. Oh, oh, but it is. We have the longest undefended border in the world. Oh, so they Michael. come in from the states? Yeah, so they come from the states. Uh, about 95% of them come through upstate New York, Plattsburgh up there, Champlain, New York. And uh, they just walk across and we've got our top federal cops, um, the RCMP, Royal Canadian, uh, Canadian Mounted Police, and they're just like, stop, 
it's illegal, s'il vous plaît, arrêtez. And then they just walk in and they are detained for less than 24 hours. And with 30, within 30 days, they are then put onto a full social services program, including our gold plated uh, healthcare system. And um, there are tens of thousands of people who have come just in the past, you know, like couple months alone, because Justin Trudeau sent out a tweet, a tweet essentially welcoming all of the world's self-professed refugees. And guess what? Once they get to what is the southern part of Quebec, we then give them an option of where they want to go. Guess where everyone wants to go? Toronto, you know, the navel of Canada. And so I was speaking to those issues. So if Richard Spencer and his ilk, who want to sit in their, their wing chairs and play pundits all day long and talk about my, my super state and, and my ethnic whatever the hell, if they want to go and do that and be, you know, pencil heads about all of that stuff, that's great. I was going and, and actually talking to the people. And every single vote that I got, 25,000. Remember, I ran in the most populous city in Canada where there are over 3 million people, okay? And I was not allowed to buy radio ads. I was not allowed to buy TV. TV ads, I was not allowed to participate in debates, okay? So every single vote that I got, 25,000 of them, was earned from knocking on doors. My reputation, frankly, and my audience online is largely not from Toronto. It's the most diverse city in Canada. So I'd love for a Richard Spencer type to run in New York City, okay, or a Chicago, yeah. or a San Francisco, somewhere, you know, wherever, a very populous, diverse city, and get over 25,000 votes. Then I'll listen to what he has to say about politics. Because what I did is I stayed true to my principles. I talked about things like immigration, like crime, about actually serving the Canadian people. Because I'm not just here as a philosopher queen to talk about big ideas and how I think it might actually work out well for our country. I'm also listening to people and what their problems are. And so I'm sorry if it offended some of the people who are these purity spiralers that I got votes that were from minority communities. I'm sorry if that offended you, but guess what? I'm unafraid of saying the fact that immigrants in my country actually like my ideas better than the ethnomasochists within the so-called European community because of these people who just think, oh, they're the noblesse oblige thinkers of, oh, we have to let in the entire third world, but I'm not too worried because I live in a multi-million dollar house. They're not moving it to my neighborhood as opposed to, you know, the guy from Ghana who's breaking his back and says, yeah, enough with illegal immigration. Yeah, I want a moratorium, you know? So, so you know, at, at the end of the day, in order for these ideas to actually flourish and to become manifest, uh, we cannot purity spiral. And so if these people want to do that, that's great. They're going to continue to be become essentially more and more irrelevant. Whereas I, I am playing the long game here because I actually give a damn. I've got skin in the game and I'm going to be around for decades to come, whether Richard Spencer or anyone else likes it uh two things first of all it's interesting that you came out against purity by name uh number two <laughs> is you asked before the show if you were allowed to curse and yeah. i said absolutely yeah but then i said you know you, you're not allowed to say sorry and you said it twice i did yeah i said i'm sorry that, that i'm oh, sorry that. no uh no no I'm, I, I'm just teasing but so it sounds like this is something that uh, I'll, so w what their perspective is and i hear this a lot is that you're playing coy that you're a full blown, you know, this is what I'm sure you hear this all the time. You're a full blown white supremacist. Because I'm good at arguing. And you're a full blown white supremacist, mm. and this is just you kind of putting on a pretty face. Mm. And you, I was born with this face. And you and Richard Spencer <laughs> are just peas in a pod. Clearly not. He counter signals me. I counter signal him. Like I don't actually give a damn about him, to be honest. I don't. Well, not think... him. Just that. Yeah. That, that, okay. That, that, um, using him as a figurehead for that whole scene. See, so this is the thing. When I don't give people the answers that they're looking for, which is, I don't know what, arriving in a white pointy hat and Sieg Heiling, okay? Um, and when I don't do that and I say, no, I'm actually a deep thinker. I've thought about these issues. I've I've read the statistics. I've read the books, you know, from the past up to the present. Um, people don't like that. I'm too hard to pinpoint. So rather than saying, no, the girl's an issue by issue voter. She's a she's a issue by issue thinker. And she engages with the material in a sophisticated, way, not in a way of just regurgitating, you know, talking points. And they say, aha, she's one of these, you know, three piece, uh, you know, suit na uh, Nazis. Piss off. Just piss off, okay? I am not going to be, to quote Jordan B. Peterson, my greatest fan, I'm not going to let you put me in a box. I am who I say I am. I live in a country where a man with full-blown male genitalia can say I'm a woman and we, by law, C-16, have to address him as her or jur or they or whatever the hell. But when I say, hey, friends, I'm not a Nazi. I'm just a nationalist. I am a Canadian nationalist. I bleed red and white. 
That I'm a red and white nationalist. That's what I am. I thought you bleed maple syrup. Yeah, that's kind of it is sweet. And so but they don't respect it. It's just so piss off. These people are such losers. These are people, I think that among the bullied class, one of two things can happen to you. You can either be like, let the bullying encourage you. I saw a headline the other day of a girl who just dropped 140 pounds after being uh, bullied. And now she looking fly. Or it's like they resent it and they're like, you know, save becoming a school shooter. They become a journalist. And then they, they just, they, they, they take it out on the cool kids and the popular kids. And, and whether they like it or not, you know, Myself uh, and Richard Spencer, I, I will say this to him, you know, we're articulate, um, we're intelligent, you know, um, we are engaging and we have audiences and they don't like it. And so rather than than um, engaging with with our ideas, they just call us names. It's just it's it's high school stuff. It's junior kindergarten stuff. So you've been pretty critical of Toronto during this episode. If you could live anywhere else on Earth, where would you choose to live? Prague, Czech Republic, beautiful architecture, homogenous people. I've been to Prague. I liked it. It's nice. Have you been to the Museum of Communism there? It's above, yeah, it's above absolutely. McDonald's. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 got great history there too. And so far as you know, they had both Nazis and Soviets march through Wenceslas Square. I'm right into it. What is your beef with Jordan Peterson? I have no beef with him. He has a beef with me. He and I were both scheduled to speak at a free speech summit. And uh, when was this? This was shortly after Charlottesville. Okay. And so the very first one uh, was essentially canceled, and then they found a new venue a venue that was willing to host me. And uh, he and the panel uh, basically said that I will no longer be invited to their free speech panel. And I was not involved in this decision. They just decided to do it. And uh, they, you know, Jordan Peterson got a lot of heat for it because this is a guy who claims to be about principles and claims to be about free speech. And there he is counter signaling a girl because as he put it, I became, uh, quote, too hot a property. I don't know that like, to quote Stefan Molyneux, that is not an argument. Like it's just not an argument. So deal with my arguments, you know, and after Charlottesville, the majority of the people didn't really um, have anything to say about what I said. It was just the fact that I was there. Well, I mean, you, let's get into the Charlottesville thing. I was there as well. Uh, both of us were doing uh, were doing reporting, me from the last chapter of my book. Mm -hmm. You got in heat because you were a reporter for Ezra Levant's The Rebel, mm -hmm. and you went on the Daily Stormers podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, is that something that you regret now? Um, I mean... Hindsight's always twenty twenty, but I was not allowed. It. By the way, they were I would, they were told explicitly, "Do not bring the Jew to the party." Oh wow! Yeah. Okay, um, I can't blame them. That's fair. Well, I mean, I'm, we not, can, a, I'm not fun at parties. I don't know how much you want to. I'm incredibly fun at parties. Uh, I, I don't I don't know how much you want to get into here, but okay. So the the criticism is not just with respect to to the 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 Stormer podcast. So a few things. First of all, to regret it would mean that I regret where I am now, which uh, I, I don't. I love where I am right now. I've never felt so liberated in my entire life. I. I don't work for anyone except for the people who support my work. And so it's a very democratized sort of process and, uh, you know, uh, sort of ecosystem that I now found myself in. Uh, but I was criticized uh, not just for that appearance, but also for my coverage of Charlottesville that day in and of itself, because uh, in the views of the mainstream dinosaur failing legacy media, I uh, basically provided protective lip service to the alt-right on the streets of Charlottesville that day. What did they use as evidence for that? I said that they had a right to be protesting in the streets that day, which they did, which was also not just... Uh, which the know. government gave them. They got the approval, the yeah. clearance. Yeah, yeah, they have it within, I mean, your your nation's legislation. And then again, by court order, right. mandated being like, yes, you can do this. The whole thing was shut down before it even began. I pointed to the fact that there was a double standard, that the left was able to march and that I was there when the left was marching whereas the right was not allowed to do it. Uh, I also talked about the fact that, you know, these statues sort of do matter and are, uh, you know, I think that they are worth protecting and actually worth marching for. I think that's great. As a student of history, that's what, what one of my degrees is in. I think that memorializing a nation's history is part of your collective unconscious in this nation. It's part of how we form an identity. It's important. So all that was great. Um, with respect to actually, you know, the, the actual Stormer uh, podcast, um, Look, I've never said this publicly before, at least I don't think, but uh, I was kicked out of my hotel that day. There was an all black staff that had packed up my bags and told me that I was no longer welcome there. Because don't forget, I got basically the first and best viz of the attack by James Fields uh, on the left wing protesters that day. Attack, whatever. He's in jail now uh, for a very long time, etc. And by the way, 
uh, by court ruling, that Lee statue is actually still allowed to right. stay up now. So it turns out the protesters were right on that front. Um, uh, um, I was kicked out of my hotel. I had no friends there. Uh, I had no uh, security. I had no cameraman. I was kind of an island onto myself. And as I was walking out of my hotel, I did a very quick interview with Molyneux. And then there was an elderly lady there and she was white and she walked up to me and she said, she said, honey, she said, I don't know where you're going. She said, but I don't want you to even go to a coffee shop by yourself out there. The streets aren't safe today. I, I can validate this. When like, I, I get goosebumps just talking about it. Yeah, well, it was five of us, four or five of us were walking down the streets and it, they, they were packed with Antifa, mm -hmm. which I'd never met before. And people were itching for a fight. Mm -hmm. Like the energy in the air is exactly, I write, describe some in my book. It's like you're at a frat party and everyone's drunk and you know what that vibe is like. It's like yeah. at any moment, violence is gonna break out. And my friend Bob, who is like, a dopey dor dorky guy they pulled his silly cowboy hat off of him you know and they were just kind of playing keep away like they were because he wasn't one of them so therefore by definition he must be a nazi even mm -hmm. though uh, and it was it was very kind of weird seeing it uh because i didn't realize it was gonna be that big a deal mm -hmm. oh no no one did i mean i did i will say that my new sense was on as it usually is but i did know that it was going to become a huge story in america i just didn't know that it would internationally pardon my French, but cuck North Korea for headlines. Like I remember Kim Jong had, you know, the so-called missiles pointed at Trump and all of a sudden it was like, bam, Nazis on the streets in Charlottesville. And that was the headline. And I mean, it's still important insofar as Biden's campaign on it. It became a flashpoint in American history. And I would argue the world and Western history. And so anyway, from there, I basically started uh, making calls to anyone that I knew on the ground who at, the point, at that point were not, I wouldn't even say acquaintances, just contacts. And basically, um, um, it became, I mean, you mentioned Antifa, but my perspective of it was, you know, people meme about the so-called race war, but that's really what it felt like. It really did feel like there was a racial sort of divide on the streets and that, um, anyway, so uh, I basically just made any phone calls I could and basically said, I'm here until tomorrow. My flight leaves tomorrow morning. I don't, I don't have a place to stay. I don't have anyone around me. And I just need to be around people who I'm confident are not going to beat me up. And I know I look really strong, but you know, I am a woman. And uh, yeah, so one thing led to another. I ended up at this house, uh, you know, and I, I told the people there that everything would be off the record for that evening. And I'm, I'm, a, you know, a journalist by trade, so to speak, and I will keep that that promise to them. But it was about 45 minutes out, and I recall the rain coming down and the lights from this van that we were in shining towards this giant house kind of in the in the backwoods of Virginia and me thinking, I don't know where I am. I don't really know who I'm with. I don't know what's next, but according to my calculus, that was um, the safest decision for me. So people can call these people whatever they want. Um, I was not afforded any sort of refuge by anyone else when, like you mentioned, the climate was incredibly thick and tense in Charlottesville that day. So anyone can say, Faith, you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have done that. Excuse you. I was on the streets. I watched bodies flying in the streets, complete pandemonium, chaos. I didn't know if it was a terrorist attack. I don't know if it was a mistake. I didn't even know that James Field's car was uh, involved in the attack because he peeled out of there so quickly. I thought it was just two cars. Next thing I know, honey's got her back, you know, of her car all crunched. And I'm thinking, what is going on? I've got family. I'm calling them, telling them, well, you know, where I'm, I get back to my hotel, my final, you know, safe space, so to speak. I'm not allowed to be there anymore. My my bags are all packed up. I'm looking at them while I'm at the concierge thinking, what the hell are my bags doing over there? So people can say whatever they want, but you try being a whatever, 26, 27 year old girl in a strange city that you've never been to all by yourself when there is a literal race war on the streets. You, I had clips of Heather Heyer that I walked right by while she was clearly not well on the ground, okay? Uh, you watch bodies flying all over the place and you tell me that you're gonna make all the right decisions the, all, uh, the whole way through, you know? So, you know, at the end of the day, Charlottesville has become a, a, a token that is used by the opportunistic left to advance their own causes. But look, it was an isolated incident. And, and Donald Trump is right. There were good people on both sides. And my viz attested to that. We had people who were U.S. veterans who were marching to keep that Lee statue up. These were not all guys with armbands. And I'm sick and tired of being told that we, the people who are on the ground, who had the front row seats, have to keep our mouths shut because to tell the truth makes us a Nazi. 
up yours. You weren't there. You don't get to tell me what I saw and what I experienced. And by the way, the reason why I do not regret going on that podcast is because I actually believe in free speech. I will talk to, if Antifa were across me from right now, Michael, you, you said, Faith, you're in Toronto. Come down to New York. Let me interview you. Absolutely. I will talk to anyone who will have me on. Okay. And, and, far left, far right, right down the middle. I don't care. I'm starved for conversation. I usually make videos out of my kitchen table all by myself. Talk to me. I don't care who it is, you know? And if you have a problem with my ideas, challenge me, you know, and, and, and vice versa. Anyway. Um, yeah, so I don't regret it. Uh, I was happy to have a front row to, to, uh, a piece of American history that day. So you were saying that there's good people on both sides, right? Mm -hmm. Would you also say it's fair to say that there are plenty of bad people on both sides? Yeah, of course. So here's the, here, let me, we have a little clip from you on that Daily Stormer podcast. And mm -hmm. this is the one I think some people had an issue with because mm -hmm. it's one thing to- Was it the joke? The joke, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's okay, one thing it. to go on a, so you know where this is going. Yeah, this is not. So it's one thing to go on a podcast and, and have an interview with huh. someone. I've interviewed lots of people I don't agree with. It's nothing to be kind of palling around with them. So I want to hear your response. So let's play this little clip. So this is you on the Daily Stormer, right? I just have one question for you, and, and my listeners would not forgive oh, me if I didn't I'm, ask I'm you. I'm waiting for it, baby. Okay, now it's an easy one. Yeah. Have you ever seen Ezra Levant mix meat and dairy? Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you that if you, if you um, and this is something that he agrees with, if you ever offer him free um, bacon, it's a real, it's like free bacon, free bacon, anyway. <laughs> so can you see how your boss is Jewish, right? He, that's his joke. Ezra, if you're watching this, you know, I know, you know, we all know that's your joke. I'm not saying it's not his yeah. joke, but I'm but saying- you're not allowed to joke with people. Look, first of all, okay, I will say this is an important caveat and I didn't mention it earlier. Crypto Report, I didn't know was a Daily Stormer entity. Okay. Okay. So that is kind of important. Okay. And okay. also, I didn't really know the Daily Stormer back then. Like, I didn't really know what it was about. I had been studying aspects of the alt-right, but I wasn't- into the Daily Stormer. I wasn't, I was doing a lot of 4chan stuff in, in part of my preparation for Charlottesville, et cetera. But I didn't even know what was going on there. I didn't know the crypto report was one of their things. Obviously I could tell that these guys were edgy. Um, but did I, did I laugh with them? Yeah, again, um, you're surrounded by people who think a certain way. And um, I'm not gonna pretend that I am Teflon and that I was like, yeah, you know, uh, I was in control at every single point. Everyone was was dubious of me when I was in there. They're like, what are you doing? Why right. are you here? You they know what I mean? They said that upset, like, why are you talking to us? Yeah. But I, what I'm saying is, do you see how people might be taken aback that you're cracking, you know, even if it's Ezra's joke, to people who are kind of literal neo-Nazis? I don't care how people feel. Number one. Well, how should they feel uh, listening to that clip? I, I don't care how they feel. I'm not going to tell someone how to feel. I'm telling you what I went through okay. and, and what I experienced. And now after the fact, uh, how I do or don't, you know, regret these sorts of, of decisions. And at the end of the day, look, uh, I'm very personable in real life. I know that I've been kind of, you know, I'm, I'm called like an attack dog and people think that I'm very harsh sometimes on, on air and stuff like that. But I actually am very, you know, personable in real life. And this was also, a, you know, a, a type of self-preservation. You know, you're among a bunch of people who think that you are basically uh, working for the enemy. You right. might be the enemy. And it's a day when, you know, things all shite has hit the fan, you know. So, again, people can tell me that they will experience things differently and they would have made all the right calls, etc. Okay, cool. You would have slept on the streets that night in Charlottesville. No problem. You do you, bud. I did me. So let me see if I can understand this, because this this actually seems to make some some much more sense. Mm -hmm. You're feeling unsafe. Mm -hmm. Any port in a storm is something we could all wrap our heads around. Mm -hmm. Someone literally died. So mm -hmm. this isn't like you being paranoid. No. Or this is, someone literally died. Do you remember that there was a helicopter that like fell out of the sky that day too and two people died? It's in my book. It was like p the Pinochet jokes. It's I was like, like, what? What is happening? It was two cops. Yeah, people were dying. They were falling out of the sky. I was like, what is going on today? It was a wild day. And also don't forget that, I mean, I don't know about you, but for me, because we were in it, I did not have the time or the wherewithal. I was not at the place where I was seeing it through an international lens yet. I was just experiencing it. I did not understand that the that the narrative had gone from right, you know, right wing patriot rally in support of Lee statue to literal Nazis killing people on the streets. I didn't realize that that shift had happened by that was that was only a couple hours later. That was in the evening, right? And uh, 
Anyway, uh, yeah, so how people perceive this, I mean, they're entitled to do that, but this was, this happened years ago. I have done a tremendous amount of work since, a tremendous amount of work before then. I mean, I've been in journalism for over 10 years now. Um, this one line in one interview in which I was quoting my Jewish boss, um, who was actually bringing in beef bacon to the entire office that day and made the free bacon joke, um, regardless, uh, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to be defined by that. And if other people want to define me by that, that's great. I don't care. I'll live rent free inside your head all day long. I don't think about you. I, I don't think it's a question of defining you by that. I think mm -hmm. it's a question of most people, I think it's fair to say, are not ever going to be in a time when they're going to be on a Nazi podcast, right? Mm -hmm. So it's hard for them to understand the thought process here. And what it sounds like to me, and I, I really want you to clarify if I'm getting it wrong is you're in an unsafe place, any port in a storm. If these guys are taking me in, fine. I don't want to be on the streets where someone might literally assault me or kill me. And it's like, okay, I'm here, but I'm here as an employee of a Jewish company uh, run by a Jewish person. I'm surrounded by people who are at the very least quasi Nazis. So I better make nice with them or else they're going to kick me out as well. Mm -hmm. Is that the thought process? Yeah. Okay. That actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I just don't like it because I feel like it admits weakness. Well, I think it ad admits <laughs> vulnerability. And yeah, I, I think don't like you, that though. But you, we were all vulnerable there. I mean, yeah. things were so electric in the air mm -hmm. that I don't think it's that much to, I mean, I, why don't you want to admit vulnerability? I don't know. I just feel like it's just not. It's well, is not, it off brand, Faith? It's off brand. And I also think that we live in such a culture of weakness. And okay. I don't like it. It's just also disgusting. No one wants to follow a weak person. And like, obviously, we're all human. So we have moments of weakness. That was one for me. Now everybody knows we can move on. Oh, okay. Well, I, well I, I, given that it's my show, I, I, I and uh, given that I'm a troll and that you want to move on, I think I want to sit here and kind of put up a hotel, frankly. Wait, wait. So why are you so uncomfortable showing uh, vulnerability? Is it because you get attacked so frequently? Uh... No, I just I just think that it's unbecoming. I think like in both men and women, it's just it's annoying to be like, I don't feel safe. Oh, like I felt so vulnerable in that moment. It's just it's not it's not a, a good sign of I don't know where we are, I think, as a culture. And I don't want to feed into it whatsoever. Do you think everything a person does has political ramifications? Everything is political. That's the very leftist point of view. Oh, I know. And you agree with it? Horseshoe, baby. OK. Uh, so do you I'm obsessed with politics. Like, understand that I am like Zuon Politicon. I am a political animal. I always have been since I was a very, very, very young child. I was a hardcore Marxist growing up. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then I had a hard shift on certain issues, and then, you know, it was one by one. Uh, but I have... Uh, you ask me about music or movies and I will look at you like a deer in the headlines. I have no idea what's going on, but I'm an info junkie. All I want to do is consume politics. And I think about most things in a political lens. And so I understand that, you know, not everyone sees things that way, but I can have a p political interpretation to just about every event that happens around me. So you've been pretty critical of Toronto during this episode. If you could live anywhere else on earth, where would you choose to live? Definitely the moon. I think it'd be great to be the first person that actually lands there. Don't you think you'd be a bit lonely? I enjoy silence. I want to talk to you guys about our new sponsor, brightsellers.com. If you go to brightsellers.com, C-E-L-L-A-R, like a basement, brightsellers.com slash welcome, you get what? $50 credit toward your first order of wine. Here's what they did. If you go to brightsellers.com, slash welcome, they ask you a bunch of questions about your taste profile. This is very smart. I hate wine culture because I don't know how to, I don't drink much, but I don't know how to pick out a wine. It's so complicated. What they do is they'll ask you which of these two things do you prefer? And by doing that, they develop a flavor profile for you. It's founded by two MIT grands. They're taking a tech approach to wine industry by designing a custom algorithm to find your favorite wine. Then they sent me four bottles. They were all different and they all tasted unique. And these are wines I would never think to pick because I don't know anything about wine, but the algorithm does. If you go to brightsellers.com slash welcome, C-E-L-L-A-R-S, you get 50% off, $50 off. All you have to do is take a short quiz and they will tell you what you will like and you are welcome. Do you lose respect for a guy if he cries? Um, 
I mean, there's obviously like if like a person's, you know, parent were to die or there's a really terrible tragedy, then but no, you could of still course have a, not. You could still have a visceral reaction at the, at the visual. Uh, I can't think of a, a like an image of a man crying and me not being in some way kind of like. Mm. But, so, know. yeah. So even if like, you know, like, let me give you an example. George H.W. Bush, okay. war hero, uh, yeah. president. Yeah. Uh, his daughter, I think, uh, I forgot her name. She died at like a very young age. Yeah. So of course a man's going to cry then. That's not going to put me off whatsoever. That's like, that's dignified. But the point is you just made the face though. Like if you saw it, would yeah. you have? No, no. I think the context matters there. Okay. Yeah. What if someone is just crying because they're just, you know, at the end of the rope and they're frustrated? You think they're like a little bitch? American Beauty, the, the plastic bag in the air. Okay, are what? you making a movie reference? Because if so, you're going to lose me. Oh my God. This is, can we put, can we find the uh, Wes Bentley American Beauty clip? This is one of my favorite clips. This is amazing. This so, is so bad. If my husband watches this, he'd be like, see, I told you. you have you ever movies. seen your husband cry? No, never. Would you kind of like Not totally once. lose your boner? Which, which is you funny. Don't say that. I'm a girl. But you know what uh, I mean? No, Would you like uh, lose he, attraction he just to wouldn't. him? He just wouldn't. That's not accurate. I feel like we've been together for over seven years. So like maybe it is accurate. No, I mean, <laughs> God forbid something yeah. unprecedented. Yeah, right, 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 it, right. I right. mean, that, that's when it no, ha- I hits No, of course you. not. I have all like my husband's my everything. I have like there's no nothing for me to feel towards him besides like crazy amounts of love. Until he cries. No, but, it's just not like that. I don't know. I just, I have like, I, it's unconditional with him. You could have unconditional love and still lose respect for someone for being a crying little bitch. No, I respect him a lot because he just patrols me on the regular. Okay, well, let's play Would You Rather. Have you ever played this game? Yeah. It's one of my I favorite like in games. I grade six. This but, is terrible. This, okay. is, this feels like a death trap. Let's do Would it. you rather see your husband cry or put on a dress for Halloween? Cry. Okay, why is that? Because uh, to cry for a man is within the realm of natural as opposed to put on a dress. Wait, how is clothing natural? Animals don't wear clothes. Yeah, but boys don't wear dresses. In the Middle East, they do. Yeah, but my husband's not Middle Eastern. Sh- sure, boys used to wear dressing gowns all the time. Yeah, but like, I didn't live then. I live now. Okay, so you'd rather see him cry yeah. than put on a dress. Yeah. Okay, wow, that's interesting. Yeah. Even if it's just like a gag for Halloween, you couldn't hit, you, you would like no, get the fuck no, out. No, because like tears, if justified, would be less effeminate than dress, unjustified. Okay, what are the, t- have you guys ever had, you must have had arguments. Very seldomly. So do you wear the pants? No, not at all. Not at all. It's very bizarre. I'm actually like very, very submissive and docile with him. So you have safety words. Stop that. I don't even know what that means. Is that bad? I don't know what you're referring she to. She knows what it means. No, that's not true. Is it watermelon? No, it's, Apple? What's the safety God, word? Forgive us. Um, no, no, no. It's just it's just that he's like, he has very, he's the least clingy person in the world. He tells me basically what to do, et cetera. It's like, it's like a refreshing part of my life where I just don't have to be in control of things. It's like him just, yeah, it's nice. Okay. Yeah. Um, what, how did you two meet? Uh, we actually knew each other in high school. We kind of ran in similar circles. He went to an all boys school. I went to an all girls school. And then we kind of fell out of touch. I always thought he was too cool for me. Uh, apparently he thought the same thing about me, but I don't know if I believe that. And um, then several years later, his parents bought this big screen TV in celebration for Canada's Fox News North, AKA Sun News Network. And one day I was on there as their token young person. And his dad called him and he was like, come in here. He's like, you need to find yourself a girl like this. He's like, wait, I think I know her. And so he contacted my sister and my sister is the pretty one. The sisters are always the pretty ones. And so I thought he was just into her. And uh, apparently he was fishing for my contact details. And then we met each other at a pool party at my ex-boyfriend's house. So he completely flexed on my ex. And then the rest is history. We've been together since. He stole you from your ex. No, I was just there as a friend. All like, I'm I'm a really nice person, and so even if like the, a romance were to break off, I was still friends with these people because I was just a cool and interesting person to be around. I, I don't understand how you could have any relationship with someone. I don't even mean a husband wife. Just mean even friendship for seven years and never have an argument. We've like, I feel like we might have had one or two. I, we honestly just don't. We're just both very chill people. I think it's because we. You're don't. not chill at all. I that am is a in total real lie. life. I what am... is this? A, what a cartoon? <laughs> I'm actually very cool in real life. Both of us, we have our eyes fixated to matters that are, you know, politics, 
religion. So the day that's the stuff opposite of chill. Chill does not mean I'm fixated on religion. Yeah, no, but that's, that's intense. But like, but it, it just means that the day to day doesn't like stress us out. Also, he's he's a hardcore minimalist and he's very like neurotic about certain things. So just as so long as I keep everything exactly how he likes it, then he's happy. So I don't. Piss what him happens off. if you don't keep things like he likes it? He calls me uh, like a uh, like a boomer. Because oh, boomers is he a, older? No, he just he thinks that boomers have a lot of things like chachka. Oh, okay. And so, so he's Marie Kondo. Yeah, and so like if something doesn't bring me joy, I have to get rid of it. We have a question from the chat room. Mm -hmm. uh, oof. Uh, what did you think of Trudeau during the election and now? Um, weak man, product of the times. Uh, I mean, the reason why I took the job with the rebel, I went in there the day after Trudeau was elected because I said we're going to be the unofficial opposition to the country, and I was right. Unfortunately, less so now, but um, he he is the perfect puppet for the globalist uh, ruling class. He has all the virtue signaling bona fides, um, plus the lack of um, intellectual stamina to actually um, really do anything besides what he's told. And so it's less so about him as the people who are pulling the strings behind him. Everyone from the Open Societies Foundation, which have co-authored immigration documents, which have groomed his foreign affairs minister, Christia Freeland, a fellow youk, um, for over 20 years now, uh, and his own immigration and refugees minister, who is himself a refugee. So he's open borders. He's brought in some of the most anti-free speech, pro uh BS sort of legislation, including the transgender bill that we talked about. And um, he is uninterested in the tradition of Canada. And his father is, is a revolutionary. He, he is a revolutionary. His father made Canada from a, a homogenous um, European uh, you know, diaspora satellite country, if you will, into a multicultural prototype, which has now been replicated around the world. And Justin Trudeau is now taking a step further, referring to us as, quote, a post, the first post-national state. So the man is really a radical. That's what I think he is. I, I don't understand this claim that Canada is homogenous when you had probably the most uh, biggest separatist movement on earth. Mm. And, and the, I love the, the French. The, and the dad made them make Canada officially bilingual. Right. That's a, that's absolutely right. So, okay, homogenous is perhaps a simplified word, simplistic word. It's just, I don't know how much like you Yanks want me to get into here. I, I never know how interesting the Canadian question is to Americans. The but CQ. The CQ. Yes. Be woke on the CQ. Uh, but uh, look, French nationalism, first of all, is something that really, really excites me. And, and the French nationalists, part of the reason why there was this separatist movement, it was actually under Trudeau Sr. And it was uh, in, a, in part a byproduct of his push for multiculturalism, because Canada was, of course, really a bicultural nation. It was founded, it was first discovered, so to speak, by the French, conquered by the British. They lived in camps of self-quarantine, but they were both foundational peoples of Canada. Let's recall that in 1867, when the country was confederated, that 79% of the people in the country were born in that country. There wasn't an immigrant nation. It's like, no, these were Canadians, right? The vast majority being French Canadians, owing to the fecundity of their women, having five, six children each. Um, so, but, and then slowly in came the various European nations thereafter, a large part of them being Ukrainians because they could actually till the land, we're used to the sort of climate. And so we had, uh, you know, leaders within Canadian parliament being like, these immigrants are okay because we need someone to settle the West and they're good at planting grain. They sort of are the breadbasket of Europe. Yeah. And so um, we, we had all this going on. Of course, there were differences in religions, but basically like 95% of them were Christians. Um, and, and it's become something very different. So in 1971, when Prime Minister uh, Trudeau Sr., Justin's dad, brought in a policy of multiculturalism, Canada was 96% European Canadian. Uh, we are now uh, looking at a future where we're going to be a, a majority minority within the next generation and that within the next century, uh, white or European Canadians will be anywhere between 12 to 20 percent of the country. So, um, you know, all of this is happening. It's just that's a fact. Those are all Statistics Canada facts. Right. And so what I like to do is talk about like hey, since none of us were asked, can we have a conversation about what this means? Does it mean anything? What, what are the possible, uh, possible outcomes? And 
also, why weren't we asked? Like, isn't that weird? I think it's weird. Like if just a bunch of us, you know, move to China, I think it'd be really weird if, you know, she didn't check in with his people and be like, y'all okay with this, you know? Um, so yeah, um, that's that's my thoughts on, on, on Trudeau. Do we have the clip? <laughs> of the plastic bag, American Beauty? Okay. Um, do you think progress? Here's the, I had Lauren Southern, your friend, on the you're still friends with her, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, on the show a, a few weeks back, a, a couple months back, and one of the questions I had for her is she seemed to have this impression that like progressivism is an alien ideology, and my perspective is that it's as American as apple pie, and it has very strong roots both in Europe and in the United States. What's your perspective on that? Okay, define progressivism. Woodrow Wilson. Oh. Well, then yeah, obviously it's Americanism, but but uh, look here. Uh, progressivism, uh, progressivism, I would say right now has become. I would, I'll define it in this way: mm -hmm. the valorization of, of equality as a, a quasi-religious principle, and extrapolating that into every uh, field as much as possible. Uh, yes and no, because I think that Americana is largely f uh, placed also on the family and sure. and Christianity, and none of that stuff is about equality. It's all got well, hierarchy bent into it as well. Equality of opportunity—that's fine. But you don't uh, think Christianity is egalitarian? No, hell no. How how is Christianity not egalitarian from your perspective? God, different ranks of angels, the priests. Wait, the ranks the of the angels are not in the Bible. Okay, are we going to really do this? I'm a Catholic, so I go by catechism. So revelation for me doesn't just come from the Bible because sure. Jesus didn't leave us a Bible. Correct, it's a church according to me, according to my faith, built on the rock of Peter. Um, and so revelation comes through the magisterium and through catechism and all these sorts of different things. Uh, and the Bible is, of course, part of that as well. So it's deeply a hierarchical, and that's not just within the ranks of you know the heavens and the church and the family with the father being at the top, then the mother, then the children, but also within the natural world as well from, you know, sand, rocks, plants, different types of animals in the animal kingdom, right? So everything is, you know, God's design is very deeply hierarchical. No question, but I, I mean, isn't there the idea that Jesus loves everyone equally? Yeah, of course, there's equality before God in spirit, but clearly not in any other way. I mean, you can't tell me that um, <laughs> equality between any two men exists, even if they are the same, you know, body mass, body fat, same exact IQ scores, etc. Yeah, yeah um, there's always going to be a way that, 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 that makes one unequal from the other, say... Um, you know, uh, a particular love interest. You know, you cannot truly make a man equal to another man. And, and God reveals that in the way that he's designed we humans. Right, but I mean, if the whole thing is that if I'm a, the prodigal son is an example mm -hmm. of this, right? If the whole thing is if I'm an evil rapist murderer and I just kind of cheat on my, I steal a candy bar, that it, we're both sinners in the eyes of God and it's only through Christ that we can be redeemed. Mm -hmm. So we're basically coming at it identically. Mm-hmm. Well, like it, insofar, if you if you if you're in mortal sin, the mortal sin is the mortal sin is the mortal sin, right? Or if you're in venial sin, it's the same thing, but like different from mortal. Um, so yeah, absolutely, there is an equalizing factor that occurs within that. But then uh, I'm not sure how you'd want to apply that, you know, to how that relates to progressivism in and of itself. Like it's like everyone who breaks this particular code of the criminal code, so to speak, will be charged, you know, under that particular code, no matter how they went about breaking it. Yeah, okay, so we have that reflected within our, our legalese, so to speak. But this business of um, of equality of outcome and, and you know, um, trying to make up for past wrongs, I think is deeply un-American. You didn't see settler nations saying, you know, we came all across the Atlantic and so you owe us. No, it's just like roll up your sleeves and do something for yourself. My grandparents immigrated to Canada and both of them never would have dreamed of spending a day on social assistance. And I'm someone who, by the way, believes in social assistance. I'm like a Rawlsian conservative when it comes to the welfare state. I do believe that we should look after the least well off in our in our country. I'm not one of these people who just says, you know, you know, tie up your bootstraps and figure it out no matter what. I understand that there are people who for either financial, uh, physical, mental variations are more vulnerable than others in society, and I wish to look after them. But at the point, at a certain point, you have to realize that we live in a finite system determined by limited resources. So we cannot look after everyone in the world, and it's enough to just do it after our own folks. Do you? So do you hold to that argument that uh, this kind of welfare state, social safety net, whatever you want to call it, is a lot easier to develop and to have actually be functional in a homogenous society? 
Uh, well, insofar as, I mean, voting trends and various statistics show that, you know, groups of people tend to vote in certain ways. And so, you know, it just so happens that European men specifically, so like women not even part of this, tend to want things like less government, lower taxes, etc. And so I think that that does help. It helps when you and your neighbor are kind of voting and aiming towards the same things in life. So you've lived in Toronto all your life. Mm -hmm. uh, how has it changed over your lifetime? Oh, it's become incredibly more diverse. Like that's 100%. Okay. Uh, the balkanization, so to speak, of our various neighborhoods have become more, uh, I'd say, entrenched. Obviously, we still have the yesteryears, Chinatowns, Greek towns, et cetera. But now we have little Arabias. Um, and there's been complete population replacements in certain neighborhoods like um Brampton, for instance, ninth largest city in all of Canada, which is just outside of Toronto. It was about 90 some percent European Canadian uh, during the 90s. And we won't have to go into how old I was back then. Uh, but now it's it's been given and these are not my names. This is just what is printed in the papers. But, you know, these pet names of Singdale or Browntown, uh, because it has been completely uh, essentially it's, it's completely inhabited by uh, people of the Sikh uh, faith. I mean, I, I, I do you have issues with, with in terms of migrants, like mm -hmm. where, if you had a list, like where do you want the migrants? I but think you want that a having Faith Goldie like make a list of, of categorization of people is a really quick way to make headlines. So let's avoid doing that. No, but you want the moratoriums. So you don't I want I just anybody. want moratorium. I just want, I want a pause. I want a me time in Canada. I mean, we've got such a crazy immigration backlog right now. I'd like to deal with those people. I'd like for us to just like, I don't know, focus on paying down some of our own deficit and debt. I'd like us to start recovering the Canadian dollar, which is you know, forecasted to plummet like a rock to about 62 cents American, which is gonna make doing business for me. I mean, I employ Americans as part of what I do, right? So paying them in American dollars as a Canadian sucks. Um, so um, there's a lot of things that we need to do, you know, and uh, I just think that helping the entire third world is not at the top of our list. And I don't say that as myself. I say that as someone who has knocked on tens and tens of thousands of doors over the past several months in my own city. I say that as someone who has spent a tremendous amount of time with our own homeless in our city. And they could use some of the billions of dollars we are now spending on illegal migration, never mind the legal variety. And that's that. Uh, also, why are we bringing in anyone who's on welfare? Serious question. Why is any immigrant in Canada on welfare? I thought, like, you're going to come here to make our country better, not make us poorer. Michael Malice here. I want to tell you guys about a new sponsor, Wix.com. And they helped me set up the site, letthatbeyourwelcome.com. You know how to spell it. One of the big arguments I've always had, I had it with Will Chamberlain on this show, oh, make your own PayPal. Oh, you, if you don't like it, make your own Twitter. Well, if you had said to someone, oh, just make your own website, it would have been the same sarcasm. But now you can do it in like minutes. If you go to Wix.com, they've got 500 templates to choose from. It's drag and drop stuff. You can use their ADI, artificial design intelligence. They ask, they ask you a few simple questions and the ADI creates the website for you. You can start building your website and publish it for free. If you go to letthatbeyourwelcome.com and click the link at the bottom, they'll give you 10% off a premium plan. Everyone listening to this, I've said this for years, even before they were sponsors, should have their own website. Your employer, that girl you matched with on Tinder, is going to Google you. You want that first result to be your domain name, even if it's just something, your resume, oh, I like fishing, something, anything. Why have them do deep digging and find something you don't want when it could be like, hey, this guy's professional and competent and put together his own website in minutes for free at Wix.com. If you go to letthatbeyourwelcome.com, you could see how easy it is and how professional it is. You are welcome. So you've been pretty critical of Toronto during this episode. If you could live anywhere else on earth, where would you choose to live? I'd say anywhere in Florida, except for the deep south. So probably Fort Lauderdale, I like. Uh, the people there, I refer to them as Q-tips. White hair, white socks, they go to church. They're my people. And you like the tan. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> I've got that med gene. I look so much better with freckles and a tan. You got kicked off of, what are you kicked off of now? Oh, dear. Let me list the ways. Okay. You were kicked off Twitter, then unkicked off? Is that right? No, 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 no. no okay. Don't give me any ideas, Jax. Okay. Hi, Jack. I love you. Never violated any TOS. Uh, okay, so Patreon, Patreon PayPal, 
uh, GoFundMe, Airbnb, Facebook, Instagram. I could list a couple of bars in there too if you want. You got kicked out of a bar. <laughs> oh, yeah, all the time. <laughs> how does that happen? Are you so how recognizable are you in Canada? Oh, in Toronto, it's insane. Okay, so do you ever get stopped in the street? And like, oh yeah, it, and is it all the time? Is it a hostel? It depends. It it it's varied. Like the other day, I was singing Bittersweet Symphony uh, in the in the uh, shopping aisle, and there was a very friendly lot. You were pers- singing it? Yeah, because like, it was on the radio, and like it was just it gets me going. I like that song. Okay. Anyway, uh, but then a couple of weeks ago, I was out for drinks with. Do you like actually, Bittersweet Symphony? Well, I don't know. Are you like, basic? Uh, I might be. You be- oh, I went okay. to an all girls school, so like, there's a possibility. Okay. You know, no pumpkin spice, but like, I might a have pumpkin owned- spice adjacent. Yeah, I'm a- <laughs> plus plus. I uh, I have owned owned Uggs in my life. Okay. Yeah. See. Anyway, uh, what were we talking about? Oh yeah. So a couple of weeks ago, I was at a bar with a. Um, I don't have to get into details, but a well-known university professor and demographer, uh, because these people, they'll, they'll meet with me in the shadows, you know, like, oh, we can't be seen with you. But by the way, your math is correct. By the way, your stats are correct. And uh, a young uh, Muslim man, I don't know why he was in a bar, clearly a very bad Muslim, walked up to me and uh, said, you're Islamophobic, get out of here. I was like, okay, what's going on over here, bud? And he said, you're just mad. He said, because your wombs are barren and we're going to repopulate this country. Verbatim, because it's branded, like it's branded into my mind. And so he was like, yay tall. And you know, I'm very tall and in heels, I'm extra tall. So I just got up from the booth and like towered over him. I was like, they teach you to say that at the mosque. And then he was like, ah, freaked out. Anyway, I sit back down, sit my wine. The guy gets uh, booted out because luckily that bar, I knew the owner. And the demographer was just there gobsmacked. He's like, did that just happen? I was like, dude, you write about this stuff. I was like, I live it, okay? So um, yeah, I get recognized all the time. I have been asked to leave out of, uh, leave bars. Actually, a funnier instance was I was with um, Chuck Johnson and Gavin McInnes' brother who lives in Toronto. And we were just Wait, sitting there. you mean there. Gavin doing his character or actually his brother? No, his real brother. Okay. Who is... Who is Miles? It wasn't way Miles? more enjoyable than Miles. Okay. okay, he's actually really, really funny. He's a great guy. And I always tell Gavin, I think he's actually the funnier brother. Um, so anyway, uh, I was with the two of them and we were just drinking beer, literally minding our own business. And this liberal do-gooder, like anti-far bar wench walks up to us and says, you have to leave. And I'm like, says who? You're bothering the other patrons. Doing nothing. We were just memeing between ourselves and kind of like, you know, shitposting IRL, but not being loud about it or anything. Anyway, so that happens. Oh, so you actually left. Yeah, and she tried to get me to pay the bill. I was like, no, 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 honey, that's not how this works. Either I stay and pay my bill or I leave and that's all on you. Oh, that's really funny. Yeah. Was she screeching after you as you left? Oh, no, it's even better than that. We wanted to go to a bar across the street and she ran out in front of us and warned the other bar that we were coming. So what happened? So we just left the other bar too because it looked lame anyway. Okay. Did you find the clip, Bobby? Okay, this is from the movie American Beauty. Hold on, before you play it, this won an Oscar Best Picture. Okay. So it's a very famous movie. Kevin Spacey, who I'm sure you're a big fan of, uh, was the lead. I actually think he's a brilliant actor. I know yeah. that he like did old boys or whatever, but allegedly. I don't yeah. want to go to jail for that. Uh, so this is a clip that I kind of relate to. I want to see what you think about it. So this is Ricky Fitz uh, watching this video. I can is there hear no it. audio? hear it? Hold on. I think there's supposed to be audio. Is there no audio? So far, this looks, I mean, dramatic. What's going on, Bobby? We're going to find one with the audio in it. Okay. Yeah, because then he starts crying. That's the whole point. He's he, the whole point, Over the bag? His whole point is that sometimes in the world, there's just so much beauty. There that, is. And he goes, I was just filming this plastic bag, and it looked like it was dancing in the air. Okay. 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 I understand it. See, context matters. I've been in church, and That's I, a great example. Yeah. That transcend, I, yeah transcendent I, moment. Yeah, yeah. I cry in church all the time. Okay. I'm always moved by the Holy Spirit in church. So like, I get that. If it, if a man is like tearing up at beauty, can we call this episode Big Boys Don't Cry? We're, well, I don't know what we're going to call it. Big uh, What do you boys. think of the whole issue? Uh, we Americans don't know anything about First Nations and Inuit people. Is that a b- big deal over in Canada? Yes. And 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 what's your perspective on that? Break it down my, for us. My perspective is actually way more nuanced and way not what anyone would think. I'm very woke on the Indian question. And I think that Canadians do not do enough for our Indian, you know, part of the, but they're part of the founding, you know, mosaic, so to speak, of Canada's uh, history. French, English, 
Indians, right? Uh, but the problem is, is that rather than actually dealing with the fact that there are people living on reserves in Canada who have no running water, uh, we we virtue signal towards them and tell them about how we stole their land. Like that's all BS. In Toronto, for instance, I'm constantly lectured about how we're on native land, but that's just not true. You know, Upper Canadians bought it from the Mississaugas tribe. Legally, everything was great, but I'm supposed to be some sort of like settler land stealer. Um, look, we have legitimate racist uh, legislation in Canada, namely something called the Indian Act. And that forbids Indians from um, being the executor of their last will and testament, for example. It slows down things like their ability to essentially function like normal adults in Canada. I think that, you know, enough of this segregation of uh, Indians, I think that they have to basically be brought into Canadian society. And so that means they have to start paying taxes, they have to get off the reserves, and we have to start to essentially allow them to function like adults and stop infantilizing them. Because it's, it's not leading anyone anywhere good, you know, um, uh, murdered and missing Aboriginal women is a huge, women are, is a huge issue right now on our reserves because, well, you give these guys buttloads of cash as soon as they turn 18, you How know, much do they get? it depends on, on, you know, the person. Uh, but I had one girl, my, one of my girlfriends, she married an Indian guy and she said that when they have kids at 18, their kid will receive $40,000. Oh, wow. Okay. At 18 years old, yeah, you're yeah. a boy, That's like 40,000 bucks is sweet. You don't have to do anything. I'm not going to college. I'm going to get myself a car, maybe live inside an apartment for a couple of months and see where yeah. this goes. Well, it looks like Ram Springer. Yeah, next thing you know, you know, you've got drinking and alcoholism uh, issues, you're huffing gas. Like this, these are real problems on our native reserves. And then that is all correlated with abuse and abuse goes towards other things like murder. I'm sorry to say, but like it, like it all crescendos and I'm like, stop it. Stop all of this. And also, why are natives allowed to live on reserves and like all be in their own mini ethno, ethno states? And if any European Canadian talks about I, it. I think we have audio. Do we have one with audio? Let's do it. Okay, let's watch this clip. I love this clip. Sometimes there's so much beauty in the world. I feel like I can't take it. And my heart is just going to cave in. How does that make you feel? Are you comfortable with that? Yeah. Wait, wait, I'm no, just acutely not. aware of the fact that he's acting. That's my problem. That's why I can't watch movies is I'm always aware of the fact that they're acting. My friend, Steph, who yeah. I went to high school with, yeah. one of her big triggers yeah. is on children's shows mm -hmm. when there'd be someone dressed as a dog in mm -hmm. a dog suit and everyone's acting like this is a dog. And she'd be like, this is clearly a person in a dog <laughs> suit. How are you acting like that? And she loses her mind. So uh, for you, uh, you can't look at that and be like, this is someone who's being intense. This is just, it's too like, this it's is a clear. person. Like my first thought was, wow, I wonder if tears are going to come out. Can he, like, what is he actually thinking about to get him into that place? Like, I overanalyze the actor. That's the issue. Okay. So we're running out of time. What was your favorite part of the interview? I'm, this is fun. And you're a very good interviewer. And I wasn't expecting so many personal questions. It was like a change. It was funny because on the way over here, I was thinking, you know, Kim Kardashian gets asked all these questions like, how do you describe your design style? And then it's mine's like, what do you think about this particular world ideology? I'm like, it'd be cool to kind of like, you know, get show a little different side of myself here. And so I, you know, I don't know if it was like telepathic, but like you managed to do that and show that maybe this, this old frozen pillar of hydrogen in here actually does have a pulse sometimes. You are welcome. <laughs> <laughs>